I wanted to welcome you to Free Wheelchair Mission's special 20th anniversary edition of the Wheelhouse webinar series. My name's Stuart Rattray and I'm the chairman of Free Wheelchair Mission's board of directors. I've personally been involved with Free Wheelchair Mission since March 2002 when I was first introduced to Don. So I've had the opportunity to be involved during most of the journey so far. It's such a privilege to celebrate our organization's 20 years with you today. Uh, we've accomplished so much, but uh, in the last two decades and have a great reason to celebrate. So on behalf of the board of directors, thank you so much for taking an interest in our work and for supporting our mission. Many of you have also been along for part of the journey and instrumental in making the last 20 years possible. So thank you. My name is Bob Shank. I'm the founder of the master's program. I'm the co-founder of the Barnabas Group. And from those leadership communities, from the first days of the free wheelchair mission momentum and movement, our community has been involved deeply in seeing what uh, has happened under Don and now Nuka's leadership over these last 20 years. Uh, I want you to know that today this event is being recorded and about two days from now, you'll be getting a link sent to you by email that you can revisit this hour, share it with family and friends and uh, expand the pool of people who are celebrating this two decade experience with us. Uh, you can use the chat function at the bottom of your screen if you have any technical issues that you'd like to get resolved. We have staff who are on board and monitoring that and ready to help with that if you need help. And then if you have some questions that you would like to pose to any of our uh, panel during this hour, you can use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen on the right. Put your questions in play and we'll do everything we can do to get uh, the things that are of interest and important to you addressed and answered. Joining us today are Don Schoendorfer, who is the founder and president of the Free Wheelchair Mission, and Nuka Solomon, who has been with us for four years as part of the executive team, is the CEO and has provided a tremendous amount of additional leadership in these days that are unfolding before us. So Don, Nuka, great to have you as part of this uh, hour together today. I don't know how in an hour we can fully address what's happened in 20 years, but we're gonna do our best. Don, let me start with you. When you and Lori started the free wheelchair mission, did you ever imagine that you would be uh, looking back on the two decades that we're celebrating today? No, um, you know, it was a slow start. We still had 96 wheelchairs that I had made in the garage and there was a lot of interest in Lori's part to get them out of the garage. And somebody <laughs> said, do you have a name? And we put our heads together and it wasn't too hard to come up with a name because we knew it had to have the word wheelchair in it and we knew it was free and i figured what else can you put in there but mission so it came up free wheelchair mission but uh you know there were problems that were being solved before i even knew that what they were i didn't even know they're going to be problems because people would come to me from a lot of them from mariner's church because rumors spread about this this remarkable thing we were giving away just four of our chairs in india and people would just say this is how you're going to solve this problem when it comes up i mean it was just amazing and it was like um it was like you, you start to hum a tune and pretty soon you hear other people humming it and pretty soon you hear a lot of people humming it and it's like there we're still humming this tune this tune all around the world it's the tune of getting people up off the ground well, Don, uh, someone who was just watching from the outside would have seen you in your garage. Uh, the first 100 wheelchairs didn't come from a factory somewhere. It came from your garage. And uh, someone could have written you off as a hobbyist who uh, just was uh, using spare time to tinker in your garage. How did you and Lori make the jump from uh, seeing it as something that you were doing in parallel with alongside your life to becoming the focus and making the transition into becoming a full-fledged nonprofit mission? Well, things that happened that I couldn't explain, I would say that there are coincidences. And we met coincidences when we made our first trip to India. And then I came back home and these coincidences were starting to pile up. And I'm, uh, I'm, it, they're, they're beyond my statistical mind 
to accept them as coincidences. And then people, again, from Mariner's Church would come along, people that are much more skilled in understanding how God works would say, Don, do you really think they're coincidences? And so uh, we, Lori and I just said, okay, well, if that's the case, why don't we just surrender? It's not our mission anyway. And how about we let it, right, let's recognize whose mission it is. It's God's mission. And that was made us feel really, well, that's why these things are happening. It, was, it became simple. And then my, my bedtime reading was the Nonprofit for Dummies series, a book that you can get now in the, in the bookstore. And chapter one was register your articles of incorporation, which happened 20 years ago to this day. Chapter two was you file for your 501c3. Chapter three was you find a board and you have a board meeting. And it just went on and on just like that. Yeah, you know, we never really paid anybody for the time they put into us for the for first few years. Everybody was just a volunteer. And then I had a little problem with my communication skills, I must admit, because when we had our first office, we needed furniture. So I put down our request by email, maybe the 50 people we had on our list back then, that I needed furniture. Use furniture for an office. Well, I should use furniture. So, well, I didn't say the office. So we wound up getting bedroom furniture, living room furniture, kitchen furniture. And our little office was crammed almost to the ceiling with furniture. So for a few months there, we were the free furniture mission of Orange County, just getting rid of the furniture we didn't need. But so I learned a little bit more about communication skills too. Your background is in engineering and uh, you're an inventor. You have uh, used those uh, incredible innate talents uh, within the realm of the medical uh, community for decades. But as you transition, boy, it became apparent pretty quickly that your niche was in creating and perfecting and constantly never satisfied with the progress that you'd made, but always looking for more and more progress. But boy, as the mission grew and as the number of chairs being distributed uh, continued to explode, it was pretty clear a few years ago that a need for some additional executive level leadership was timely. And Nuka, you joined the Free Wheelchair Mission four years ago to help to solve that uh, very important need. And with a career background in the nonprofit arena, uh, you had an opportunity to look at moving into a critical role with the Free Wheelchair Mission to uh, bring the strengths that um, are uniquely yours that complement, but don't they're not redundant with the skill set that Don has as the founder and as the inventor and as the refiner of the hardware and the heart that drives that forward. You brought some incredible important uh, contribution uh, in you joining our team four years ago. I forgot to mention, I'm a member of the board of directors and have a stake in what is happening here and uh, love to see what God has done in bringing you in as part of the team. Tell us, how in the world did you make the decision about shifting your primary and long-term focus from what you were doing before into the role at Free Wheelchair? Well, thanks, Bob. And it's true as a board member and Don's a board member, and we had several others that had a huge stake in the decision. Um, I thank you for your trust um, because as we all know, Don um, loves Free Wheelchair Mission and he cares very much about what the legacy of Free Wheelchair Mission will mean. So I take it very seriously that I was trusted with this role. Um, Don talked about coincidences and surrendering. And I think those words <laughs> make um, uh, have a lot of meaning in terms of my story. Uh, when Free Wheelchair Mission came a calling to me, I was sort of looking for a change within my nonprofit career, but not really. Um, in the past, I had been thinking a lot about what I could do um, that would have a global impact because of mu much of my fundraising experience and nonprofit experience had been in terms of helping local communities here in the United States. Um, as a first generation American, um, my parents are from Haiti um, and that's my, um, my love and my heart outside of all that the United States has provided me. Um, giving back to Haiti and countries like Haiti was something that I always wanted to do while still re residing in the United States and paying my taxes and doing my goodwill here. Um, and so I just hadn't found the right place. Um, and Free Wheelchair Mission came a calling and I thought, oh gosh, you know, how am I gonna do this? How am I going to 
here I am based in Los Angeles. The office is in Orange County, which is a good hour away. Is this right for me? I'll entertain an interview and see, but you know, this will just be exploratory. I'm not gonna really do this. Um, and then I you know, had the long grueling interview with some of uh, your fellow board members and Don. And you know, I just knew when I walked away, I said, oh Lord help me because I really want this job. Um, and then within 30 minutes or less, I got a phone call to, you know, when could I come back? Um, and that was a great honor. And, you know, then the ball kept rolling and here I am. Um, so I didn't think I would be working at Free Wheelchair Mission, to be honest, just because of the geographic location. But I knew um, that it wasn't a coincidence and I knew I needed to surrender to the calling to be the next leader. Um, and for me personally, it was a no brainer because of the fact that um, Free Wheelchair Mission is having not just a global impact, but a lasting impact in the hearts of many. And because of my heritage, I understand that inherently, um, what that means, what it means to my family to know that I am helping in this way, um, not just Haiti, but um, many, many countries um, all over the world. Uh, Nuka, you are very strong intellectually, so nothing for you is a no brainer. But let me say too that in the role of CEO, uh, you tell can... my kids that, please, Bob. <laughs> uh, listen, kids know it all. We know that. Okay. Uh, that's a that's another hour at another time. <laughs> but it would be easy as the CEO to find yourself immersed with issues surrounding staffing and spreadsheets. But the truth is that a movement like Free Wheelchair Mission is grounded in the stories that um, are not necessarily depicted in zeros and commas as much as they are individual anecdotal moments where you watch the effect on the front lines of uh, what we're committed to making possible. Uh, there must be a highlight or two that over the last four years has uh, become a motivating force for you. Tell us at least one of those, would you? Oh gosh, at least one is tough, I'm sure for, for Don as well. Um, but of course, I'm sure with everyone who has been a valued um, supporter of ours or team member, it's always your first trip, right? Your first trip where you give out that first wheelchair. And many who are probably participating on this webinar have heard me talk about my first trip, which I was super blessed that it was to Haiti, um, which I hadn't been back to visit in many, many years. And that first wheelchair I gave was to a boy who looked like, you know, one of my kids. Um, and, and I could have been his mom, you know, were it not for the fact that my parents immigrated here. And he was um, a boy who was an amputee and had suffered from that big earthquake that happened many years ago in Haiti and had gone all of the time before without a wheelchair. So I was delivering his very first wheelchair and knelt beside him and, and got to meet his mother. And it just, I, I had just such gratitude to him for trusting me um, to deliver that wheelchair, trusting me to put him in that wheelchair because he was used to used to having his crutches. Um, and I just had gratitude to God for, you know, really giving me the opportunity to see the blessing of that moment and all that transformed in my own life um, and it transformed my parents' life for me to have you know, come to that moment. And like I said, it could have been my, my own child. There was that moment. Uh, there was, uh, other um, people on that trip that really suffered through the earthquake and got to see that, you know, here I am um, living in the United States for so many years, but I've come back to help them. Um, there's, a, there's something special about that as someone who's first generation American coming back and being able to speak the language and really show compassion and understanding that some others may not be able to show um, because I understand them in a way that you know they know I do. Um, so that happened in Haiti, and that also happened in that on that same trip not too long after in the Dominican Republic. I visited um, these what what they call um, bateas, which are uh, sugarcane plantations that harken back to the colonial times, um, and you have. Um, Haitian immigrants who are living in these very rural parts of the Dominican Republic in huts that, I mean, have no running water, no electricity, 
and they're working the land and many of them are in situations where their health care is compromised. And for me to come along and, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm imposing upon them, you know, in their wonderful, what I consider to be quaint and beautiful homes, despite the, the conditions. And they're, they're shocked that, you know, I look the way that I look, that I can speak Creole, that I can speak French, that I'm coming with a new device for them. Many of them have never gotten anything new. Um, and all the while, there's a little girl that's sitting next to me and she's literally eating paper because that's all that she had to eat that day. And her parents are feeding me um, the corn that they grew um, and they're giving it to me and not her. And that's because they feel such gratitude, but they didn't realize that it was really me that felt blessed and grateful that they welcomed me into their home. So there's tons of stories like that that are impactful. And it's not just in Haiti or Dominican Republic, but I've had those experiences in Central America and in Africa. But the resounding story is that we're impacting every single time I see we're impacting the lives, not just of the wheelchair user, but of the family. And that they are not just grateful for the wheelchair itself, but grateful that we are coming to them with care and concern for their hearts. Um, and for their situation. And then they are giving it back to us by praying for us and thanking us um, as we go off on our journey. Don, uh, the same question, really. We're, uh, we're at risk if we just look on the surface of seeing this as a hardware distribution entity where we have chairs and we take them to places where they're needed and we distribute them but you've helped the movement to understand that we're not just in the wheelchair business, that our real effect is transformation. You've had 20 years of experience. You've watched tens of thousands of people receive the chairs and uh, wheel off different than they were when they came. Would you share with us a, a, a scene or two that sticks in your mind and continues to confirm for you that you are doing exactly what God has wired you to do in the leadership that you have provided over these 20 years with putting the free wheelchair mission in motion? I'd be happy to, Bob. Um, this is back in probably 2011, a vision trip to Chile. Uh, we had uh, oh, about 10 supporters with us, people that had helped fund free wheelchair mission and whenever I have a chance we would bring them and they could actually participate in what Nuka was talking about what I was talking about about this transformation process and we we were in the back of an alley and we come up to the the address of the person who was going to get this wheelchair and over in a corner there was this it, it sort of looked like a doghouse but it was big it had a pitch roof to it and it had a front and it had a doorway and it had sort of a like a canvas cover so that whatever was in there could be kept dark. And we met the family and we asked where uh, Leonardo was and they went over and knocked on the doghouse door and Leonardo crawled out as if he was a dog. It was so sad. I mean, that was the best the family could do. I mean, the family was doing their best so you can't fault what they were doing, but Against the uh, wall was a wheelchair, but it had no real wheels. It just had two casters. And, and, uh, and they said they used that when they ever had to move him, but they would use it as a dolly. Um, they couldn't set it down because it would just tip over. And Leonardo came out and uh, he hadn't been in the daylight for a long time. I don't know, you know, we were at about noon when we were there, but he was, his eyes were just running with tears, but I don't think it was because he was at that point he didn't know what was happening, but he was, the sun was just so bright in his eyes and his eyes are watering and he's wiping his eyes. And he had very strong arms, but he had a, a, a maybe it was polio. We never did hear what it was that had taken out his legs so that they could not be used. And we had a, we were just introducing the, the gen two. And so we had a team and we're, you know, I'm telling them all about what I'm doing while I'm doing it and making the adjustments for him. And uh, I had a really good friend, one of our supporters to this day, Charlie Cruto from um, um, Massachusetts. He's in a wheelchair as well. He is in a wheelchair since he was 18 and he's probably my age, but he had all the benefits of, you know, Western medicine and 
Uh, but we brought him on a trip uh, to give away chairs. And we, with Charlie said, I, went and, I need to teach this Leonardo how to use the wheelchair, you know, how to go over a ramp and how to most efficiently use his arms for, for, for moving. So we, I push uh, Leonardo out and we go out to the street and Charlie's about ready to start explaining through an interpreter how to use this wheelchair. Leonardo takes off down the middle of the road with a speed of which Charlie couldn't keep up with him. Here we have Charlie who's, who trains people how to use wheelchairs, trying to keep up with Leonardo. They're almost out of sight. Fortunately, Leonardo, I don't know what caused him to, because he could have kept going, I think forever, but he turned around and he came back and he was laughing and crying at the same time. It was just so ecstatic. It's almost like he broke out of prison. And, uh, you know, that life in that matter of just a few moments, you get to see what that, what that wheelchair, that $80 wheelchair meant to that man. That man. He was probably in his 20s. By you know, your description, Don, he did break out of that prison. And the chair and your care for them helped to make that possible. Nuka, for the last year, uh, the world has been uh, trying to navigate through what we've called a pandemic, but it's been a, an unexpected intrusion into everyone's lives. How has that specifically affected you and our team at the Free Wheelchair Mission? Uh, what have been the, some of the effects, the challenges that you've been facing? Well, I would say first and foremost, uh, it's been a reminder um, for us that, and, and to our supporters who know us, that uh, the people that get wheelchairs who are, I would say, sometimes forever quarantined um, until they get the wheelchair have suffered far more than any of us have endured in the last year. Um, so it's kept our, our minds focused on our objectives so that when we come out of pandemic or we get blessed to be able to go back to whatever the new normal is that we still need to think about those people that will always be in a semi quarantine until they get a wheelchair. So it's been a, that's been the blessing, the reminder. Um, it's also been a blessing to um, have all the tools in place that our programs team has had in terms of being equipped to be virtual because there are several countries that we can't visit because they're in situations that are unsafe. So um, basically honing the, the tools that we have at our disposal. Um, but the challenges that we faced um, are the reality that our partners are dealing with um, now this pandemic when they were already dealing with a lot of other issues, natural disasters, poverty, et cetera. And it has turned upside down for them the implementation of our wheelchair program at times. So we've been equipping them with safe, um, pandemic protocols in terms of how to provide safely despite um, restrictions. Um, so that's continued. We face the challenge of increased pricing. You know, like many companies or organizations, there has been an economic effect to this pandemic. So we've seen the price of raw materials go up and astronomical shipping prices go up. Um, and that's something we're still contending with in real time. Um, we don't know when the end will be for that. Um, we're extremely prayerful and we're doing everything that we can in our power to be good stewards of the dollars that we receive despite that reality. Um, but there will be potentially some lasting decisions that we will have to make as an organization given the low price point of our current wheelchair that you know we have to you know potentially look at for the coming year to come. So, um, uh, but overall, we've done well um, in terms of our ability to continue to distribute. Thank you. Hey, we, uh, if you're joining us today uh, during this live hour, we would very much like to hear your questions that you would like posed to this leadership panel that we've assembled for this 20th anniversary webinar. So use that Q&A at the bottom right screen uh, corner and uh, let us know what you're wondering as we approach uh, this celebration with reality attached. Hey, Don, um, we're hearing today about some of what has happened over this last 20 years of free wheelchair mission history. Uh, we're all familiar with the iconic Gen 1 wheelchair that was the white plastic uh, patio chair dropped into a tubular steel frame. And it's an icon for sure, but 
over those years, you began to discover that there was a need for some more sophistication in the chairs that would be offered. And so Gen 2 and Gen 3 have come along and uh, you've been in, um, just committed to uh, constantly finding ways to improve the product that we've been able to make part of this transformation uh, ministry that you had. Uh, but tell us, would you, uh, without giving away any trade secrets, what are some thoughts you have about uh, what's going to happen with the wheelchair products that we're offering to the world of need going forward? Well, we've spent the last couple of years really focusing on a, um, three different things. And one of them is really is longevity of the wheelchair. And it's a really just a basic, simple minded idea. If you can make the wheelchairs last longer, you can take the new wheelchairs and give them to new people. You know, we replace the wheelchair if someone wears it out. But if, it, if we could extend the life for wearing out, we wind up giving out more chairs to new people. Mm -hmm. And so we focused on that quite a bit. Another area is we learned that if the person is adequately trained, they get better use of their wheelchair. They're happier, they're healthier. But we can't personally train the recipients all around the world. We have to train our distribution partners on how to train the recipients. So there's been an incredible effort spent in the last couple of years coming up with training programs. Uh, we've really been impacted by the virus because we can't travel and actually train. So now we've developed um, um, virtual training programs to better prepare a user who maybe has never seen a wheelchair before in their lives, how to use a wheelchair. And then the third thing is, um, you know, we're over our shoulders watching the developments in manufacturing um, and, you know, manufacturing skills and technologies are always moving forward and the people that could take advantage of the most recent breakthroughs can make a more successful product and, and make more money. Well, that's not our object, but we, we do think that we can start to take advantage of some of the modern manufacturing techniques to improve our wheelchair manufacturing. So that's the, those are the things we're, we're focusing on for the future. That's great. Uh, a question for both of you, and I'd love to hear from both of you with this. Um, we're celebrating the milestone of 20 years, but there have been milestones that we've celebrated in terms of achievements leading up to this moment. Uh, Nuka, for you first, uh, what from your four years of leadership experience with Free Wheelchair, what are you most proud of that we've been able to see accomplished together over this time? Well, the obvious is 2017, you know, getting that millionth wheelchair out. That's the one everyone thinks of. But for me, um, in my leadership of the organization, it would be, um, I kind of think of it as a free wheelchair mission trinity, the team, the partners slash users and the supporters um, and how the, the trinity has rallied and continued on through this pandemic um, has been the true demonstration that we're a sound organization and can handle anything. Um, that's what I'm most proud of because I feel like that's my responsibility to make sure that we continue for years to come to be able to deliver the mission. Um, and our partnerships in particular, um, people don't realize this when they first get to know us. They think of the average nonprofit that gives out a medical supply as being fly by night. Um, but we use the word partnerships when we work with churches, clinics, hospitals, NGOs to give out these chairs because it's a true partnership, it's a marriage. You know, we're, we are holding their hand, we're teaching them, we're investing in them, we're praying for them. And this is, this is it, this is the big moment, right? A pandemic, how did we deliver? How did we hold their hand? And how did we ensure to them that they would have confidence that despite the challenges we were going to, you know, be by their side as fearful as they may have been that with the United States even suffering, that we may go away. Um, so I think that's what I'm most proud of, that we've demonstrated that our partnerships are lasting, that we can continue forward um, no matter what. Nuka, you bring four years of uh, exposure and experience and executive oversight. Uh, Don, you've been uh, part of this at the leadership level for 20 years, same question. What are you most proud of in terms of achievements during that 20 year period of time? Well, the first thing is our focus. And the, you know, we, we've, we drafted a mission statement about 20 years ago and it really hasn't changed. It's the same thing we wanted to do in 2002. And uh, we want 
we want our recipients to know that the wheelchair is coming from God and God loves them. And that's part of the reason why we have the partners we have and the fact that we trust God and focus on this mission. Second thing is we've, we have a reputation of trust. We've developed it, we've focused on it. This is really important. We, uh, our supporters trust us, our manufacturers trust us, our distribution partners trust us, our people who we do business with trust us. Free Will Tradition has worked really hard and we've got a, a very high level of trust and respect because of that. And then the third thing is I think is we build a machine, how to, how to get wheelchairs from people in the United States who many times have never even developed and visited a developing country. We are our bridge we can get a wheelchair made, we can get it shipped, we can get it delivered. And, and it, it works like a machine. It's like a well-oiled machine. And I'm really proud of the fact that it works so well. Only because we have such a good staff, good volunteers, good supporters, good partners, good manufacturers, all that stuff put together into a good machine. That's great. I couldn't agree with you more. Hey, for both of you, and I'll start with Nuka, um, we're looking into the future, not just into the past. The past is a prologue, but the future is our calling. And Nuka, I'd love to know if we were to uh, uh, stage this uh, same kind of webinar 20 years from now, what would you like to be able to report to these friends who are joining us for this remembrance? What would you like to be able to report to them that has happened because of the effort that has been put in by all those partners that you've talked about in the next 20 years? Well, first, I want to hope that we all look as young as we do now. <laughs> um, but in, in seriousness, um, we are the top wheelchair distributing organization in the world. Um, and I don't want that to change. I want that to continue. Um, I want to know that in 20 years, um, we are still on the top of giving out lots of wheelchairs, but that we maintain our focus, as Don put it, um, to doing so responsibly um, and maintaining the trust, as Don said, of our supporters, our partners, and again, our team that we're doing so in the way that we were meant to do so. So that's ultimately the objective, giving out as many wheelchairs as we can responsibly. <laughs> Nuka, you made a statement that um, I don't want uh, the folks joining us to miss. Uh, we are already the number one distributor of free wheelchairs in the world. Uh, yes. I, I want that to sink in. There is no entity that distributes more wheelchairs at no cost than free wheelchair mission. That's, it shouldn't be. It, it's something I actually think about every day. I think of it as much as, and I, I may be, you know, a little bit overstepping here, but as much as maybe Amazon thinks they're the number one distributor of whatever it is that we all buy from Amazon, um, because there's 75 million people that need a wheelchair, according to the World Health Organization. So how can we not, yeah, be, think of that as one of the most important things, just that, that nugget, that, that data point, right? It's important to recognize that though we've achieved that number one in our category status, that it's only serving to propel us and motivate us to increase the pace and to stretch further and faster and farther than we have to this point. Don, the same question. 20 years from now, you'll be 59. Uh, <laughs> what would you like to be able to look back on in the uh, next 20 years and say, there, by the grace of God, we've gone? Well, let me start with our vision. Um, I'm just going to read it so I get it exactly right. Our belief in a world where everyone who needs a wheelchair will have one. That's our vision. And it's going to take a lot longer than 20 years. No offense, Bob, but it, it just is to have everybody in the world get one. But we, our tagline is for no one should have to crawl. And I, those are seven words that sum up the heart of us. And if those seven words will infect the hearts of our listeners, our country, our governments around the world, I really do believe that at some point in the, maybe it's a 50 years, a hundred years, at some point, everybody's going to have a wheelchair who needs one. 
and that's an aspiration that um, has some uh, uh, holy uh, wind behind it. Don, when you say that Free Wheelchair Mission is a faith-based humanitarian organization, that's a lot of words. What does that mean in practical terms to you? Well, it was really God's intervention in Lori's life and my life that led to the creation of Free Wheelchair Mission. We used our our faith in God and how He was helping us with all these things, these coincidences that I mentioned earlier, to develop a device to address a huge humanitarian need. Thus, the humanitarian side of free wheelchair mission. It was a wheelchair, but we quickly learned from our international organizations, our partners who, who wanted to give these wheelchairs away. They wanted to use it because they wanted to share God's love. And so, well, gee, what a wonderful combination. God's working on that side too. So um, we, we wanted to work with organizations that would share that message to the people who got the wheelchairs. Um, we insisted there's no discrimination uh, in who gets a wheelchair, um, whether it's age, race, religion, tribe, politics, whatever, there cannot be any discrimination to who gets the wheelchair. And to answer your question, uh, that if we will your mission is a humanitarian organization, but we honor God in everything we do. Thanks for that. Uh, we've got some questions that have popped up from the folks that are with us. Um, here's one. Uh, we know that the pandemic has had an effect uh, around the world. And we know that our chairs are produced internationally and then put into motion through containers to the dozens of countries where distribution takes place. They're wondering what impact has been uh, occurring for us at the production level. Have factories been able to keep up with our demand uh, based on their own circumstances and requirements to shut down all the things that came with that? Don, do you want me to take that or do you want to take it? Okay. <laughs> so initially uh, last year uh, when the pandemic hit our, our Operations had to shut down in terms of the manufacturing side uh, for a little bit over than a month, uh, but we were prepared for it. We had some wheelchairs stocked up and um, we usually take a pause um, at that time of the year anyway. Uh, and then we were back up for business and the impact was not so much on the manufacturing side at that point, but is what I mentioned earlier in terms of the partners and navigating what the impact would be for them to receive. Um, and then longer term, so a few months later than that, um, we were impacted by the higher raw material prices. So that is directly linked to manufacturing and then the shipping, which we're still contending with today. Great, another question from uh, the folks joining us. Um, do we have the distribution capacity if we could double or triple our funding uh, availability from our partners who are our supporters, uh, do we have the distribution partners to make that possible? Where is the limitation for us going forward? That's a very good question. Uh, Don, do we both want to take that? How, how do you want well, to yeah. handle that one? Well, I can start. Um, okay. It would take time to scale up our distribution partner network. Um, it would take some funds to do that too. It wouldn't be just funds for wheelchairs, but you know, I mentioned the importance of training uh, distribution partners and that that would be a very important thing if they were to grow. But I do believe that, um, I mean, our partners, as Luca, what you were saying that wheelchairs have made them very um, successful in their countries because they give away wheelchairs. It's helped the partners in our countries, in their countries grow tremendously and they would love to grow more. So I think it would take time. That's my answer. Let's hear what Nuka has to say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my answer is the same. It, it would take time. Um, you know, it's not a, just a, you know, instant injection of revenue equates to doubling or tripling the number of wheelchairs that we get out. Um, we know now with the number of partners that we have what their current capacity is to receive. And are we meeting their full capacity to receive? No, we're not. Um, so obviously there are certain things we could do right away with more revenue. Um, but once we reach that maximum of what their capacity is to receive, then to what Don is saying, the time that would be needed would be to 
get um, more training um, in potentially more team members of, around to, to train more partners. Um, and maybe in some cases, looking at how we could do more in certain countries. Um, so maybe it's investment of certain team members in those countries like we've done in Central America to have a little bit more focus. So there are certain things we could do in the near term um, in a big way. And then if we really wanted to make exponential growth, um, we would have to have um, time to gear up. Let me uh, say as an uh, inside outsider or an outside insider, but as a member of the board for years and a supporter of free wheelchair mission uh, all the way from the beginning, let me say this. I've watched uh, the leadership that Don and Nuka provide uh, to assure that um, at both ends of the supply chain, that a high degree of expectation of excellence is present from the manufacturing side to make sure that um, we're getting the best product. Don can create an ideal prototype, but we need to make sure that that product coming from the factory is matching our expectations. But I'm delighted that uh, Nuka and Don are both saying the same thing with regard to distribution partners, that that's the critical supply chain uh, partner of the, of the whole master plan that puts the distribution, that puts the, the, the recipient of the wheelchair in the right chair with the right training at the right time with the right kind of support. And all of that from the factory side to the distribution partners on a broad front uh, is a critical um, management and um, quality issue that is overseen by these guys and they're doing it in an incredible way. A last question, we're running out of time, but I, I wanna ask this one. Um, there are 220 or so countries um, in the world today. Uh, we currently have had a history of distribution and how many of those, either one pop up? Go ahead, Nuka. You're asking how many, did you say how many countries we've been how in? How many countries from? have we distributed? Yeah, we've been in 94, we just added, um, the most recent one was Yemen, so um, that's 94. So with that question, here's the question. Um, are we going to more countries? What will it take for, for us to get to the rest of the countries where there is a need that um, we would be the right providers to supply? Uh, well, um, first and foremost, we have to get out of this pandemic. Like I said, we have to scale back up, right? Um, and in terms of countries, you know, sometimes it's not so much about getting into more countries, it's about getting to more partners within countries we're already in, right? So currently we're at, you know, 30 plus countries that we're in presently um, with 56 or so, 55 or so current partners. Um, in some countries, we have as many as three partners. Some countries, we only have one. So um, you look at a continent like Africa, right, which some people think of as just one country, but it's got a plethora of countries. W you know, there's so much we could do in Africa, but does that necessarily mean that's strategically the right thing for, for us in terms of potential importation challenges, communication challenges, in terms of us getting feedback from them and really adhering to the level of strong um, training and partnership that we would need to so our team is not so much focused on, we wanna be in every single country around the world. We more focus on, we wanna make sure we are reaching all the partners that could do our work well. And in some cases, like I said, it's multiple country, multiple partnerships within a country. We have a question from uh, one of our viewers uh, asking, because we're a faith-based Christian backed uh, nonprofit, do we only go to countries where there's a Christian majority or are we distributing in places where uh, the recipients are not Christian? They come from communities that are not Christian. And uh, do we have any aversion to going into places where our faith is not their faith and where uh, the opportunity to meet the needs um, is with people who um, do not have the same worldview or the same faith foundation that we have? Well, I, I could take a stab at that one. Um, we, we give away a lot of wheelchairs in Vietnam and in China and or Iraq and Pakistan. And that's just a few of the countries that I know that are non, not Christian based. And uh, we have no aversions to doing that. Um, it's harder for partners to, 
to operate in countries like that, they have to be careful um, on what they say and how they say it. Um, we trust them. Um, they know how to survive. We do not know how to advise them any differently. And we have full trust in how they distribute the wheelchairs. Nuki, you might have things to add to that. No, I would completely agree. It goes to what you had said earlier in terms of our organizational values. Um, we, we are a faith-based Christian organization because that is our value and we want to demonstrate with every wheelchair that's given that the person is loved by God um, and that they get that message when they receive the chairs. But that does not mean that we only give it to people that already know God or that um, worship God in the way we worship God. Um, so this is our value, but we're not necessarily trying to um, discriminate, as Don mentioned earlier, based upon politics or religion or culture or race, right? So there's many um, countries that we're in, as Don mentioned, and then, um, but then there are some that are in those circumstances, but they're still giving the message that I just talked about of, of God's love, despite the fact that they're in tough um, geographic or political um, or even warlike situations. Um, and then there's others that are secular that can't do that or won't do that. And we agree to work with them because quite frankly, they're doing very good wheelchair distribution work. Um, and we pray that despite their, their inability to give that message in great detail, that, um, that just by fact that the, the recipient is getting the wheelchair, um, that they understand um, that God had a hand in that. Question from the audience. Uh, have we considered doing television commercials or public service announcements? I think <laughs> what they're saying is this is a great message. How do we make our audience bigger? Well, I don't know if I want to be on every uh, newscast. <laughs> All of a sudden, you, you have people coming along and uh, poking you on social media. No, I'm joking. Of course, it would be great to be everywhere. Um, you know, that was the thing when I first heard about free wheelchair mission through the recruiter to get hired. That was the first time I knew it existed. And I'd been living in Southern California for more than two decades. So um, the more people that can know about us, the better, because I think that once people hear about the great work that we're doing, that's our selfish reasons, but then the greater humanitarian need of 75 million, the better. Um, the challenge for us is really monetary. You know, um, we have to balance between spending money on wheelchairs and manufacturing and the program and everything that goes into the program, what our, what our supporters would think of, you know, the mission and operations and having an advertisement on a cable news network or a, you know, regular news network is operations. And so, you know, our supporters would love for us to do that and see us there, but then it would mean that we're spending less money on the mission. But then the catch 22 is if we spent more money on that, then we'd be able to give out more. So it's, it's my eternal keep me up at night challenge because that is where it's extremely expensive, right? Um, those things cost tons of money. And to be honest, we can't really um, guarantee the return on that investment immediately, right? So um, yes, it's something we're looking at. Yes, we would be open to that. If, we, if there are people that could help us, please contact me. I'd be more than happy to receive their counsel, their funding, their, their contacts. But that's the challenge, Bob. And that's really the challenge I would think for any good steward of a nonprofit. Great. Well, time for one last question. Um, we talked about the 20 year mark forward. What are the primary focus uh, challenges for the next two years? Don, you or me first. <laughs> well, it's again, it's uh, we're hoping to implement a lot of these things we've, we've changed on the wheelchair to increase its longevity. Um, and then um, take a good hard look as to what might come, what become might be coming up next. That'll be the next couple of years. As far as a, as far as product. Yeah. Don and Nuka, thank you for devoting your lives to this mission, and thanks for the gift of this hour to allow friends from literally. We've had some feedback from folks from multiple continents who are dialed in on this conversation. 
and are listening because they've seen and benefited from free wheelchair mission themselves in their own view. Uh, as we conclude this time together, uh, Don, Nuka, any last thoughts that you'd like to leave with us? And I'm gonna ask Nuka to kick that off because ladies first is appropriate. Um, what would you like our friends to hear before we finish, finish this hour together? Um, I always tell people um, to think of us. So if you are a volunteer, you're a supporter who writes a check, you know, that's an act that you do. And then maybe you put that aside and you move on to your life. But I want people to think of us regularly um, because I want people to share who we are um, with their friends, their families. You know, you ask that question about the commercial, right? And can we afford being on networks and that sort of thing. But if everybody exponentially shared about free wheelchair mission with their friends and family, um, that would be uh, of huge value. And I ask everyone to check out our upcoming events. We've got a great move for mobility coming up in the month of May. We've got our annual miracle of mobility, which will once again be primarily a virtual event in July. And we ask everyone to just continue to embrace on um, everything that we're trying to achieve. Great answer, Don. Yes, well, I, I, a lot of similar to I will say what Nuka had already said. I think there's two big bits of information we need to con communicate to people that have probably will not even believe it the first time they hear it. One is 75 million people needing a wheelchair. That's really hard to believe. Second is we have an $80 solution and we can get a wheelchair manufactured, shipped and delivered that is gonna return mobility uh, to a person, one of those 75 million people. And if people were to say that, you know what I heard? I heard, I heard last week there's this organization in California that they're claiming there's 75 million people and, there's, and they have a solution, one at a time, $80. I didn't think I needed to look into that. And I wanna tell my friends and my family and my neighbors, that would be the best thing that could happen to us. Talk. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Nuka. I want to remind our friends that in the next couple of days, you'll be getting a, an email from Free Wheelchair Mission that will give you access to this uh, recording. And I want to encourage you to take that access and distribute it to family and friends. Think about putting it in play to everyone in your contact list. Uh, you can stand behind this movement with integrity and submit it as a solution for a crisis your concern for the need doesn't get legs until you put it in motion to make a solution possible. How do you do that? As Don said, $80 a person to give dignity and mobility through your friends and partners through free wheelchair mission. Uh, you wanna get involved? Connect us with your social media. Join the move for mobility in May or the miracle of mobility that's coming up in July. Lots of opportunities. Go to freewheelchairmission.org, our website, and see all of the ways that you could be involved. And I just want you to know that uh, this is a year when uh, the moves that were made in the midst of the pandemic have been extended into the 2021 year. That says that you can donate up to 100% of your income in this 2021 year to nonprofit causes. This is a year to step up. Uh, wouldn't you step up with us and join forces to make mobility and transformation possible for more of those 75 million people? I want to encourage you, go to the website, freewheelchairmission.org, and hit that donate button. Uh, take the biggest number you can feel uh, possible, and then add a zero and put it in motion. And we promise to deliver free wheelchairs in partnership with you in a way that will change the lives of people. Thank you to Stuart, our chairman, to Don and Nuka for sharing this special time with us. Make sure to share it with friends when it comes back as a uh, re-experience for you in a couple of days. God bless you. Thanks for being with us today.